All right, welcome to everybody who may be with us tonight. Yeah, everybody that's in here, welcome to you, and uh, good to see all of you guys. Looks like I just was noticing out in the cafe out there that uh, it looks like we got a bumper crop of uh, shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. I think Tanya said it may be a record this year. It may be, yeah. So that's good. That's a good thing. And uh, we had people, now a couple of things, and this is just somebody watching online, may, their, your church may be participating in this also, and I'll just put a little bug in your ear so it'll be helpful to you. Uh, the, in, the, in these envelopes, you know, it takes, what is it, $7 now? $9, now? $9 now? Well, it takes $9, and, and of course that pays for getting the boxes shipped. Of course, the shipping companies that are participating with it both... 18-wheeler delivery and whatever it may take to get it to wherever it's going, like a, a, a ship or a plane or whatever it might be, I'm sure they're giving lots of money for their service. I mean, they're, they're, they're contributing for that. I'm sure it, it would cost way more than that to get a box like that around somewhere. But anyway, the point is, those that when you put money in those envelopes, it needs to be a check or a money order. It doesn't need to be cash. I know it. I know it. A lot of people do. And uh, it's because on the envelope, nowhere does it say, don't put cash in here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're thinking, well, it, you know, that's what it should be. And then the people get it. But what happens if it's cash, it's not that, you know, anybody has a problem with cash. It's just the fact that uh, when the boxes get to where they're going, there are lots of volunteers that are taking the money out of these envelopes and and then putting them in a central location. Well, if it's cash, you know, there may, be a, there may be a temptation to put a little bit of it in your pocket, you know. And I'm not accusing anybody of that by any means. And you would think that probably that'd be the last thing anybody would ever do. But if it's, if it's not there, then it's not available to do. So then, you know, you just take away that temptation. And uh, so they want it in cash or, or money order. And what Tanya has to do with our boxes, because I know we have a lot of them with, with cash in there. And uh, what we'll have to do is Tanya will have to go through those and uh, take all the cash out, deposit it in the church's account, and write a check from the church to, to that so that it can be done right. So, so when it gets there, they don't have to go through and do the, you know, all that. So anyway, uh, somebody watching may have, that may be in your mind. And also, we have a lot of people, <laughs> and uh, we've got several bags out there of toys and things, little things that go in the shoeboxes where somebody completely overbought, you know, like they probably bought enough stuff to go in five shoeboxes and, just, you know, <laughs> can't, can't get it. It's really easy to do. I know. A shoebox is not very difficult to fill up, is it, it's really? Not, you know, yeah. Uh -huh. You don't mean you overstuffed it. I mean, no, you don't. I didn't understuff it. <laughs> I didn't understuff either. Uh, well, no you, really I know it. Especially when you start but getting. I mean, and it didn't really cost that much. Right. How much do you think you prop just a, in a, a, in general? $6, six dollars. About six or seven dollars to yeah. put enough stuff in that shoebox to. So it really is not a lot of stuff. Not a lot, you know, um, but in, Mm -hmm. and a uh, stuffed animal and some soap and wash rag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't have any. You can't have anything liquid in there, you know, uh, because it doesn't travel well. You can't have any candy. Yeah. Oh, that'll be cute. <laughs> They'll love that. But, yeah. And especially when you get a little bit older, you know, if you're putting stuff in there for like a 12 year old or something like that. Um, it's hard to buy something very small, you know, that goes in there. But, uh, you know, it, it is uh, uh, challenging, let's just say that. The, the shopping is challenging to, to get something significant to go in there that you would like to, for somebody to have and to not overdo it, so to speak. And uh, so anyway, so we, yeah, we've got to get, we have to get some more boxes. We, we bought them as a church. We bought them uh, so they would all be alike and... Yeah. Actually, the box itself is a gift, you know. I mean, the, the box with the, oh, yeah. with the lid and all that. And so that becomes part of the actual gift itself. And, uh, 
And anyway, we're going to have to get some more of them because we got several that just left bags of stuff out there to <laughs> fill in some more boxes with and so forth. But anyway, uh, anyway, it's going good. So, so we're going to dedicate them next Sunday and, and then be all systems go. And that'll be a good thing. Um, and, and the Lord's blessed. And, and little missionaries will go forth. They will. They'll go forth. And, and hopefully souls will be saved. Lives will be changed. Uh, little boys and girls will receive something that will make them happy and be a blessing to their life and, and share with them a little bit about Christmas. Because, you know, we, we in our country um, celebrate Christmas, and it's one of our, one of our um, holidays, traditions, and everything about our country. And we forget that everybody doesn't have that. And so it's amazing if you can even, if you could even encourage them to consider Christ, period, you know, because in their culture, they may not, Christ may, may, may not be a deity for them. It may just be something that they hear about or one of many type things, but to know that for us and the one that are sending these gifts, it, it is, a, this is the most significant um, deity God in our lives, that it is, he is God, he is the Lord, and he alone is the way to salvation. And that's what those little tracks that'll be in there talk about, and how to receive him, and why we feel this way. And it's in the language that they speak, and, and it's in little coloring books and little cartoon things that they can read to each other, and depending on the age, you know, it's appropriate for the age of whatever they are. So anyway, very good very good way to do that. Uh, that had to be an inspired Holy Spirit thing. I know it did. There's a lot of people at the store when I was there. That uh -huh. were doing, were the doing it. Thing. Yeah. yeah. I, oh. I had put socks in right. them too. And <laughs> and shirts oh, yeah. Socks. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. So if, if you guys watching online don't even know what we're talking about, uh, check, with your, check with your church or check around. And Is anybody doing Operation Christmas Child? Because it will be a real good part of your life, be something significant at Christmas. All right, so we are in the, uh, we're in the laws for the wife tonight. Yeah. Hot dog. All right. And we finally got to it. We finally got something interest, guys that are interesting to us. All right? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, did did you did you guys uh, do your homework or read your lesson and kind of uh, answer around on these questions? I'm not going to ask you to, to read them out loud in class because I think most of them are way too personal <laughs> to do that with, and I wouldn't really I wouldn't really want to stir up anything with it. But um, I know that if you did do that, that it is. Uh, meaningful to you because one of the things and this is just a, an observation about this from basically years of 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 course i've been tanya and i've been married for 40 years so i do have some experience with relationship of of a wife but also as a pastor i've done a tremendous amount of counseling through the years with people whose only problem in their marriage is this uh, and when I say this, I'm talking about the man's side and the woman's side, that, that they just don't understand that there's a difference. And because they don't understand, they, they, they violate these two things. The men violate uh, giving the wife the sense of security of knowing that she's loved more than anything else in life and that you would die for her as quickly as you'd draw your next breath. You do things that are contrary to that without even realizing that that's what you're doing. And those five laws that we went through, you know, the law of sacrifice and honor and affirmation and the law of security and the law of excitement are ways that you express love to her. And if you violate any of those, you are actually saying just the opposite to her, that you're not number one in her life that something else is more important to you than her. And that's the way it's received. And you see, you may violate that and not even be aware of it. You may not even know that that's what you're doing because you don't think that way. Well, what, what that message or lesson, what those five uh, points are is say, look, these are important. This is important for you to do not for your sake, but for your, for your wife's sake. Mm -hmm. 
to create in her uh, a platform by which she can be everything that God intended her to be. Because you're going to need for her to, to reciprocate this. And if you don't build her up, so to speak, she's not going to be able to have the platform to be able to provide for you what you need in life. And, and you need for her to be able to do this. And so these are very important and don't take it for granted and don't overlook this because this is, uh, no matter what you say with your mouth, what you do uh, reflects what you really think and feel. And, um, and, no, and you can say, I love you, and I love you, and you know I love you, and you know you have always loved you, and you, you can say that all you want to say, but if you're violating the law of sacrifice or the law of honor or the law of affirmation you know, or the law of security, you're doing things that are making her insecure and, and upset and nervous and anxious and all of that kind of stuff, and you just continually do these kind of things, then you know, you're undermining what you're saying with your, with your mouth. And ladies, likewise, same thing for you. These five laws that we'll be looking at tonight are, you know, are just vital for your husband being respected and uh, I, I'm going to read this first paragraph, and I'm going to read a little, a little bit of the notes tonight that, that Tanya and I have written. So, because I think, it, I was just reading over them this afternoon, of course, obviously looking back through, and I think the, the notes, the way they're written here, say uh, some things that, that I could take 45 minutes saying, and it says it in, in just a couple of sentences. And so I, I, I'll, I'll do that on, on a few of these things and, and then bounce off of that. Uh, on anything that, that I believe the Lord wants us to look at. But, but if we look at it, if you just look at the opening paragraph for the laws of, of, of the wife, uh, for the wife in respect to the husband, according to Ephesians 5.33, which says what? Um, husbands, love your wives, and wives, see that you respect your husband. So in Ephesians 5.33, Paul is telling us, that women need to sense they're loved and men need to sense they're respected. So according to Ephesians 5.33, husbands are commanded to supply love and wives are instructed to respect their husbands. To men, now listen to this, ladies, to men, respect is love. In other words, when, when we men sense respect from you through our glasses that we see life through, we see love when we sense that you are respecting us. As a matter of fact, uh, I noted in here, uh, studies reveal that men would rather feel unloved than disrespected and inadequate. According to surveys and all kinds of studies, psychological studies and relational studies, it has come back that men, and it's not, and it's not really unexpected because the scripture tells us that that's what we need is respect. But the studies have come back, look, I, I would rather feel like my wife didn't love me to, than to feel like she doesn't respect me or she, or she dishonors me. And so men, to men, respect is love. And, and, and so anyway, we think, I love this line, and Tanya wrote this line, because I don't remember writing this, but I think Tanya wrote this line. And, this is, and listen, this is, this is a good truth here, ladies, about this. We think that love should be unconditional. So, you know, on your side, and I'm not, I'm not trying to accuse anybody here. Y'all know that. Every one of you guys are probably, you know, you, on top of this list. I, 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 don't, I think all you guys probably have really stable relationships, and, and you're trying to do everything that it says. So I'm not really accusing anybody here. It's really all those people that are watching online. <laughs> all you guys are watching online. It's y'all y'all the one. But li listen to this sentence. We think that love should be unconditional. And we do. I mean, you, you say, uh, I want my, my husband should love me unconditionally. My, love, my husband should love me no matter what. I mean, it's not that, uh, that I have to meet some kind of standards for him. So love is unconditional. We tend to think that love is unconditional, but, but respect, well, that has to be earned. And so the implication here is from the woman's side of the equation, it's like, okay, you should love me no matter what, whether I'm whether I look good or whether I'm, you know, let myself go or whether 
I'm sick or whether I'm healthy or whether, you know, I'm, uh, things have gotten difficult. Or, in other words, uh, love is unconditional. Well, there shouldn't be any conditionals, and I expect you to love me no matter what. But, but then we have a tendency to think, but respect has to be earned. You have to earn respect. If you've done something to, be, to, to um, uh, create a disrespect, then I don't have to respect you until you earn my respect. So, ladies, you aren't always lovable, but you expect your husband to choose to love you anyway, right? Well, likewise, your husband may not always do what you think is best, but you should choose to show him respect anyway. The five, following five laws will reveal ways in which you can convey this respect. So what, what I'm just saying to you is that pay attention to these because these are the way that you show respect. Now, likewise, to, to not do these or to do the opposite of this is going to show disrespect. And it's going to create an unstable environment. I mean, look, ladies, just like your husband needs for you to be at a certain position in his life so that you can supply what he needs so that he can be stable and, and can be the man God created him to be. Likewise, likewise, you, you, know, you need to be at a certain position in order, and he has to be at a certain position in order to meet the needs that you have in your life. So when you disrespect him, you are creating a position for him that's way lower. And so he's not going to be able to be the man you need him to be in your life if he doesn't sense that he's being respected. It's kind of like God put us together so that we could be better together than either one of us would have ever been alone. And when he put us together, he created a brand new creature, according to the Bible. You know, uh, let a husband leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, that they would be one. So once God puts you together, you are a brand new creation. You're something that's never existed before. I mean, I'm, once Tanya and I were married and we made that commitment and we followed through and we, and, and we vowed and we made a covenant with each other, which is what marriage is. And, my, and, my, and in the covenant, I said, I'm going to love you in sickness as well as in health. I'm going to love you through all of the conditions of life. And no matter what, I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to forsake you, and I'm not going to be unfaithful to you. I'm going to be to you a true and faithful husband so long as we both shall live. And I said, I do, which is a, co a covenant commitment. And then she said the same thing. She said, I'm, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to honor you, and I'm going to respect you, and I'm not going to give myself to another, and I'm going to be a true and faithful wife so long as we both shall live. And when we said, I do, then all of a sudden now we are in a covenant relationship, and, and we, we are in the process of becoming one. So becoming one means that now we're not Keith and we're not Tanya. We're Keith Tanya, you know, I mean, we're, 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 we're a whole brand new creation that's never existed. An actual miracle takes place is what happens where we used to be two separate entities. Now we're just one. And so God's working in our life as no longer two separate people, but as one who is a brand new creature that's never existed before. And so God expects us to, uh, to be what we promised that we would be and what we pledged to be. And so uh, the problem that we have is that we don't, uh, because we, we see things through our own needs and our own uh, values and what we need and what we want in life, we have the tendency then to try to provide for our mate what we think we would want. And so what happens with that is we don't need the same things. And so if we're not made aware of that fact by something like this, then all through life you may be going through thinking that you are just doing everything you're supposed to do in this relationship and they just aren't responding like they're supposed to when in fact 
you are not doing what you need to do. You're doing probably the exact opposite of what you need to do. And you're killing your mate because you're not supplying for them what God says they must have. I mean, Ephesians 5.33 is not saying when you feel like it, this is what you need to try to do. <laughs> you know, this is saying this is what you must do because this is what the other person needs. Now, remember, we're talking about a need here. We're not talking about a want. We're not talking about, hey, it would be good if you had this. Our life would be a lot more fun if you had this. We're talking about the fact that life is not going to be as great as it is intended to be if you don't do this because they're going to go, your mate's going to go through life needy. And when they go through life needy, what that does is it creates a crack in the armor of your life and your relationship, which will allow someone else to come in and start providing what that need is and become part of the equation of your life simply because uh, you left, a, you left a, the door open by not meeting this need and someone else would come in and say, hey, I can meet that need. You're so wonderful. Let me, let me, let me, you know, you know how you steal somebody's mate, right? I mean, you guys remember this from your dating years, right? You remember this like from junior high when you first started dating or, you know, when you first started being interested in boys and girls, you remember, you, you know how to steal somebody, right? Mm -hmm. The way you steal somebody is you yeah. find out what the other one's not doing and you start doing it. That's how you steal somebody. And so anyway, um, that's, uh, that's what, that's what the, we want to prevent, right? That's what we want to keep from happening. So according to the scripture, this is the way we do it. First law, ladies, first law of showing respect is the law of the shepherd. You, need, you, you must allow your husband to be your shepherd. Mm -hmm. And by being your shepherd, what I'm saying is, just like Jesus is the shepherd of the flock, the shepherd of the sheep, God holds you men accountable to shepherd your family. And ladies, he, he holds you accountable to be submissive to your shepherd. Now, let me, let me, let me read this uh, out, of, out of our manual, and then I'll kind of expand on it just a little bit because I don't really want to say something and just leave it hanging, which I can because I ramble all over the place a lot of times about stuff. But let me just read, the husband is the shepherd of the family. The original word for, sh for husband is husbandman. And then it was shortened to husband. So uh, the way the word husband came to us by, from the word husbandman, which is an agricultural word. A husbandman is a, somebody who tends the vine, who takes care of the, the cutting away and, 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 you know, and making sure the vines produce what they're supposed to and, and make sure that the limbs are trimmed so when the fruit comes on it, it doesn't break the tree down because they're so heavy and all that. In other words, a husbandman is a tender of the vine or a tender of the fruit. Well, in, in agricultural sense, uh, uh, the husband is the tender of the flock. He's the, he's the shepherd that makes sure the sheep get the grass and are protected from the enemy and, and, and know, you know, and know where to go and, and, and have things provided for them and they're protected and they're, and they're led and they're, they're loved and they're provided for. And of course, the, the term shepherd in the scripture is very familiar to us because Jesus is obviously the shepherd of our flock. And I noted in your notes, uh, John 10 now, John 10, and I, I'm going to read a little bit of it uh, so that you can see some of the thoughts here. But I want, to, I want to mention to you that when I start reading this, obviously, Jesus is talking about himself. He's talking about the fact that he is the shepherd who is the shepherd of our flock and, and what that's about. But I want you to, to remember or to think about the fact that uh, in connection with a, the with a husband, Ephesians that we just read, Ephesians 5, connects the fact that just like Jesus is the shepherd of the flock, we husbands are to be the shepherds of our family. Let me, let me show you what I mean. In, in, um, in Ephesians, I'll go to Ephesians first. Here's Ephesians 5. It's verse 23 and uh, 24. 
No, verse 22 and 23 and 24. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Here it is, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So what this is saying is that in every family, there has to be a head. If something has no head, it's dead. If something has two heads, it's a freak. I mean, a, star, a car doesn't have two steering wheels, thank the Lord. Doesn't have two sets of brake pedals unless it's a driver's ed car, thank the Lord. Because I'm telling you, if it had two sets of brakes, we'd be standing on our head lots of times. But anyway, the point is that somebody has to be responsible for the decisions and the direction and so forth. And according to the scripture, who's, who is it that's responsible for this? Well, the husband's responsible for this. God clearly holds we men in relationship with our families to be responsible to lead our families, to be the head of our families, to protect and provide for and, and, and care for the spiritual life. Now, in connection with that, because Ephesians has connected shepherds and husbands, listen to what Jesus said about a shepherd and what his job is. This is from John chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Listen to what it says. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So what Jesus is talking about here now is a violator who tries to get to the sheep in some way other than the door of the sheepfold like climbing over the fence, climbing over the rail. Now, I'll, let me just say this, and this is going to be one of those little offshoots that, you know, this will be just one of these little offshoots. Sometimes really knowing a lot of the, a lot of what it's talking about has a little bit of interference in the, the analogy here, but it still fits, but I, I just want you to know I feel responsible to, to tell you this because you hear this mis- taught all the time. As a matter of fact, you rarely hear anybody teach this right, really. And of course, I'm right, so, you know. <laughs> of course, yeah, sure, I'm right. But, uh, but anyway, what Jesus, I mean, that verse that we just read and what Jesus is going to say in the rest of the verses that I'm about to read is talking about false shepherds. It's talking about shepherds who try to steal the flock who try to gain advantage of somebody else's flock uh, by, by entering into the sheepfold some other way besides through the door. They try to climb over the sides. They try to tunnel under the walls. They're, 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 they're looking for a way in to, so they can take advantage of the sheep. So this is talking about false shepherds. This is talking about people who pretend to be from God who aren't, people who have ulterior motives, people who are trying to gain advantage like con men over the flock. They're, they don't, they're, their real interest is not in caring for the people. Their real interest is getting the money that they can from them and taking advantage of them and teaching them wrong things and getting them to follow the wrong way and all that. Whether this person thinks like that or not, they are a false shepherd if they don't come in through the, through the door. Now, let me just show you because Jesus keep, keeps on talking. So really, now keep in mind, this is talking about people. This is not talking about the devil. We know the devil is always looking for an advantage, but this right here is not talking about the devil. It's talking about false ministers, false preachers, false teachers, false leaders, cult leaders, uh, ignorant people, uh, people who are doing things whether they mean to or not that are not led by the Spirit of God, who have ulterior motives, who deceive the flock and fleece the flock and dishonor the flock. And there are millions of them. You can watch TV right now and see just almost every channel that has one of them on there. Will be This is what they are. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold but climbs up some other way the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
So the real shepherd comes through the door. Now notice who he's going to say the door is. To him, the porter opens the door, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they're not for they know not the voice of the stranger. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they, uh, they were which he spoke unto them. In other words, the disciples are sitting there going, what in the world are you talking about? This sheep and the sheepfold and blah, blah, blah. Now Jesus has just said to them, here's what he just said. He just said, all right, in, in life, guys, one of these days I'm going to be gone. I'm not going to be actually here physically with you, and the Holy Spirit's going to be living inside you. And there's, there are going to be false shepherds that come to you. There are going to be people who, who are not real, who are there to try to take advantage of you and try to uh, lead you falsely and convince you and manipulate you and con you and, and seduce you. And they're going to try to take advantage of the fact that you love me and they're going to pretend that they like me and that they're going to lead you in the right way and teach you the right things. But I'm going to tell you, unless they come through me, Jesus said, unless they enter by the door and, and, the, and the porter, the Holy Spirit opens the door and allows them to come in and, you, and they legitimately walk in and they legitimately enter in and they're, 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 they're true shepherds, uh, they're going to try to take advantage of you and they're going to try to lead you and they're going to try to stray and they're going to try to scatter you and they're going to try to take advantage of you and steal from you and kill you and destroy you and all of that. That's what he's talking about. And they didn't understand that he was talking about himself, you know, and so forth. Now, let me read the rest. Verse 6, This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke to them. Then said Jesus unto them, listen, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that have ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enters in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And then here's the verse. Everybody gets all whacked out and misapplies every time. The thief comes, not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So what is Jesus teaching us there? Jesus is teaching us that there is a, there is a shepherd. There is a true shepherd. There is a good shepherd. So in the family, men, you are the good shepherd. You are the one that lays in the door of the sheepfold so that no enemy can come into the sheepfold unless it comes over you. But there are going to be all kinds of enemies that try to climb the walls and tunnel under the walls, and they're deceptive people. They're con men. They're tricksters. They're hucksters. They're people that are out trying to take advantage of the innocence of the sheep and try to get it, gain advantage over the sheep. And if they come any other way than through the door, they're a thief and a robber. And what a thief and a robber wants to do is to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's, that's not talking about the devil. See, that's where, I mean, I know that people may hear that and say, oh, Pastor, you're just crazy. You're just kind of straining that and that and swallowing a camel. But no, I, I'm not saying that that's not what the enemy wants. That's not what the devil wants. But the devil can't do any one of those three things. The devil can't steal you. The Romans says, for nothing can remove us from the love of God. Not height or depth or creatures or under the sea or over the sea or angels or demons. or whatever. I mean, the Bible teaches that the enemy cannot steal you from God. When you get saved, it's like God puts you in his hand and he, he holds you like that. Now, in order for the enemy to get you, the enemy would have to be strong enough to break open the hand of God and to pluck you out of God's hand. And we know that's not possible, so that's not talking about the devil. Now, I'm not saying that's not the devil's intention. I'm just saying that when we, when we look at that passage, and a lot of times you hear people say, the devil comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. Well, 
you know, yeah, he does in a roundabout sense, but he can't do that to you. It's, it's talking about a person, a person. I guarantee you that there are people out here who are not led by the Spirit of God and are not interested in the mind of Christ that would love to come in here and steal certain people out of this congregation and convince them to follow them because they have some money they want or they have some prestige or they have something that they want, try to take advantage. But they can't do it because the shepherd is in the door. And in order to get to the sheep, they got to try to go some other way besides through the door. And to kill, the devil can't kill you. If he could, you would already be dead. What did, what did Job say? Job, uh, when, or the devil say about Job? God said, have you considered my servant Job? And what did, what, did, what did the devil say to God? Well, yeah, I've considered him, but I can't get to him because you've got a hedge around him. And I'm just saying that God has a hedge around you. And if the devil could get inside that hedge, he would get in there and have a whale of a time. He would destroy you. He would kill you. He would mutilate you. He would destroy your whole life if he could. But he can't because there is a hedge around you that stops the destroyer. And it's the blood of Christ shed over your life. And the Holy Spirit's protecting your life right now. So the devil can't steal you from God. And the devil can't kill you. If he could, he would already do it. And he can't destroy you either. He doesn't have that power over your life. Now, he can seduce you and he can tempt you and get you to destroy yourself, get you to play his game and, 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 and defeat and curse your own life. Like I've said, and you've heard me say this before, temptation is an invitation by the devil to follow what your beady little heart desires follow what James calls the lust of your life, what you crave after and what you are seduced by. And make no mistake, the enemy is aware of what your weaknesses are and what your tendencies are and what your choices have reflected about you. The, 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 the devil is not omniscient like God. God knows everything. The devil does not know everything. The devil only knows what you have allowed him to see and what you speak out of your mouth. Now, he has a network of demonic activity and he has a network of assignments and some are assigned to you and their job is to let me know where the cracks are. Let me know where the weaknesses are. Let me know what kind of desires this person has that's not godly, that, that could be seduced and so forth. And so even though the devil doesn't know everything, he has a tremendous network where he's given all kinds of information. And so therefore, what, what conditions need to be possible and what choices you would make that's what he knows. He knows the tendencies that you would have. And that's what he offers up over here as temptation. You know, it's like the lure dangling over here saying, ooh, this is what I've always wanted. Ooh, this is what I really think about. Ooh, this is what would make me great. Ooh, I don't see any danger in that. And then when you chomp on it, then he reels you out. But you're the one that has made the choice. The devil didn't come in and do anything to you because he can't. Because God won't let him do that. God won't let him violate your will. God will not allow him to overpower your desires and your, your will, just like he won't violate your will. But you can violate it by making poor choices and by following your lust and your desires and, and allowing the enemy to lure you, you know, out of the sheepfold, so to speak. So that verse is not talking about the devil. It's talking about the fact that there can be violators that come to our flock. And men, what this means to us is, what I'm saying about this is, you are the shepherd of your family. God holds you responsible. You say, I don't want to be. Well, I don't care whether you want to be or not. Too bad. Too bad. <laughs> That's right. Too bad. You're going to stand before the Lord one day, and the Lord's going to reveal to you the issues of all this stuff. I don't know how that's going to happen, but we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and, our, and it says, and your works shall be revealed. So you're going to get to see, and then your works are going to be judged, yet so as by fire, the Bible says, and if it's gold, silver, and precious stone, it'll survive the fire, and it'll rise up and, as praise and glory. And, and if it's wood, hay, and stubble, then it's going to be burned up by the fiery judgment seat of Christ. And you'll suffer loss, but you'll be saved, the Bible says, yet so as by fire. In other words, 
you might come so close to hell that you can smell the sulfur on you. But just in the nick of time, he'll just say, Phew, I got you. Because you're washed by the blood of the Lamb. And uh, you've suffered the loss. There's no crowns for you. There's no, you know, except the crown of life. Uh, there's no reward, so to speak. But yet you'll be there because you have committed your life to Christ, no matter how pitiful you've been in reflecting that the love of God and the Word of God is a covenant between you and God. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, is what it says. Not whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and then live a perfect life shall be saved. But when you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And, and, and I'm not trying to teach you that you can say, oh, Lord, save me, and then go live any way you want to. I'm just saying that anyone who has truly committed themselves to the Lord wants to reflect the image of Christ. And the Holy Spirit challenges your life to be that. And no matter whether you're in church every day or whether you're trying to, you know, walk away from God, somehow the Holy Spirit just won't let that happen inside of you. And he keeps challenging, he keeps knocking, and he keeps convicting, and he keeps, so that it might be five years down the road, but you, you one of these days, you're gonna, it's going to dawn on you, you're going to turn around and say, oh God, how could I have been so ridiculously ignorant about all of this? And there's going to be some repentance and so forth. And and, and I don't know how to explain all of that. All I know is, thank God, he's the judge and I'm not. Because I'd send a bunch of people to hell. I know I would. I'd turn them into crispy critters. I know I wouldn't be as patient as God. And thankful, I probably would have been one of them, you know. <laughs> so thank the Lord, he's in control of that. But, but my point, my point is that this is what being a shepherd means. It means you have that responsibility to sleep in the door of the sheepfold. That means everything that comes against your family, you are responsible to come against. And wives, in Ephesians, the Holy Spirit ties the thought of being a good shepherd to you and your responsibility to your husband by saying, you wives, you obey, you submit to your own husbands as unto Christ. So the responsibility is whether you like it or not, whether you think they're a good shepherd or a crummy shepherd, they might not always lead in the right direction. Sometimes it may seem that they're going the wrong way, that they're not leading right, and you're, everything in you is wanting to rebel against that. Everything in you is wanting to scream out and say, you ignorant idiot, we're going the wrong way, man. Come on, turn around. You know, but the Scripture says you are to submit to that in spite of that. And that, that if, you do, if you don't submit to that, you're undermining the authority of the shepherd in your life. You're basically looking at the shepherd and you're going, you're leading me wrong. Come on, man, turn around. What's wrong with you? Are you that dumb? Are you that ignorant? Which is total disrespect. And remember what I said, men receive respect as love. So if you disrespect them, what are you saying? I don't love you. I don't have any respect for you. Don't have any, you're, not, you're not my leader because you're not leading in the right direction. I'm only following people that are leading me in the right direction. Well, what you're trying to be is the shepherd. You're trying to be the shepherd. And I'm just saying, you see how subtle this is? You see how easy it is to violate this? Because just like you expect your husband to love you, even if you put on some weight or you don't look as pretty as you used to look or you've started being sick or you've you know, had some kind of uh, breakdown in some way and, and, and you, you're saying, man, you're, you're supposed to love me unconditionally you know, and regardless. Well, just so, you're supposed to respect him unconditionally. Just the same way, he needs that just as much as you need to be loved. Not wants to be, but needs to be loved. And if you don't respect, then you undermine the authority that the Lord has placed in your home to give you that love and security of being deeply loved by somebody that you follow just as the, shep just as the sheep follow Jesus as the shepherd. And so that's what that's really teaching and that's what it's really saying because a good shepherd, what a good shepherd is, they're there to protect the sheep and they're, they're, uh, the livelihood and, and all of that of, of the sheep. And so um, there are some very subtle ways that, that you can, you know, basically disrespect your man. And I'm just going to go over a few of them just so you can see how easy it is to violate this so that hopefully you, you won't do any of these things. Now, you could add... 
a bunch of other things to this, but just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, let, let me read, let me read the, uh, the, um, th this little line. God has an order of authority in all things because anything with no head is dead and anything with two heads is free. Many homes experience division simply because the husband and the wife are trying to lead. Women motivated by their need for security. Now listen to this. Women motivated by their need for security tend to want to control things. Ladies, you tend to want to control things because you want to feel secure. If you feel like he's not leading you, then you want to take control because you want to feel secure. That's one of your natural tendencies. So please know this, that some of your desire to control your family has to do with the fact that you're not feeling secure because you don't think he's leading you in the right direction or you don't think he's leading at all. So you'll have the tendency to want to take control. Unfortunately, men interpret this as disrespect and distrust. Women are instructed to be submissive to their own husbands following him as the head of the home, even if he leads in a way contrary to what she thinks is best. The only exception to this would be concerning something illegal, immoral, or unscriptural. And I'm just saying that you're not responsible to follow him into something that's illegal because remember, love, husbands, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, and the Lord would never lead his flock into something that's illegal or immoral or unscriptural. So those are the only three exceptions. If he's leading you into something that's illegal, you have the right to say, no, I'm not going with you. If it's immoral, no, I'm not going with you. We're not doing this. Or if it's unscriptural, if it's against the word of God, then you say, no, I'm not going with you. Other than that, other than that, you're supposed to follow. Now, I'm not saying that you can't subtly suggest, that you can't creatively suggest, but you, you just can't outright rebel against that or it's, or it's disrespect. I mean, that's just all it is to it. Now, let me just show you a couple of little, I just wrote down a few little things uh, kind of in answer to, to the question down here where it said, men, list three things women do that make you feel as though your authority is being undermined and disrespected as a man. Now, let me just show you a few little things. All right, number one, get somebody else to do a project. In other words, you don't come to your husband. Something needs to be done. You don't come to your husband and say, "Hun, we, we need to get this done. Uh, can, you know, you're so good at this or whatever. Let, let's, can you get this done? Now, it doesn't mean he has to be able to do everything, but it means he's responsible for doing it. It means he's responsible for seeing that it gets done. Oh, uh, we got a pipe leaking. We need to get this fixed. All right? He's not a plumber. He doesn't know anything about plumbing. He doesn't have any tools and all that. Well, okay. It's his responsibility to... Go, go call somebody and make sure it gets done. Yeah, to get it done. But when you go to somebody else before you come to him and you say, hey, Johnny, you're a good plumber, man. I got something going on at the house and we need to get it fixed. And you just bypass him. What you've just said to him is I don't respect you enough to give this to you because I don't think you'll get it done. And see how subtle that is? How subtle it's saying, I disrespect you. You're not really a real man. If you were a real man, you could do something about this. But since I think you're not a real man, I'm going to ask somebody myself. Get her done. All right. Number two, don't try, uh, you, you don't try his way first. Sometimes men, you know, say, all right, here's what we need to do. And then you say, well, I don't know. We need, might need to do this. And then, and then instead of doing what he feels led to do, even if you think it's not going to be successful, that's not your job to evaluate whether it's going to be successful. It's your job to be submissive. And so if he says, let's go this way, if it's not illegal, immoral, or unscriptural, then you're responsible to follow that way. Now, when it blows up in everybody's face, then you look at him and you say, well, thank God, all right, we'll go the next, where else, what do we need to do now? You know, rather than saying, well, I told you so, and meh, meh, meh. You know, because what happens is that, that un, that, that's, that's a disrespect. Because he's, you're saying to him, I don't even trust you enough to even try it your way. 
that's so stupid. I don't even know what to think about that. You know, and so that's disrespect. Here's the third thing, not sharing in solutions and discussing uh, what, what comes up in the family. In other words, you just take control and instead of involving him in the discussion of what's going on, the kids are making bad grades, uh, somebody's skipping school, somebody's uh, going around with the wrong person, somebody's on the internet watching pornography at night under the pillows, you know. Um, whatever it might be, you just take control and start doing it, and you don't even talk to him about it or discuss with him. He's the protector of the family. If you notice something that needs to be corrected, at least discuss it with him. At least say, hey, what do you think we need to do? I just saw this. I saw this, and this is what I think is happening, so what do we need to do? So when you, when you don't do that and you just take the bull by the horns yourself and you don't run things by him, that's a, that, that's a, that's a disrespect to him because that's basically like saying, I don't think you can handle it. I don't think you can do anything about this. I don't really need to talk to you about it because you're so ignorant you wouldn't know what to do in the first place. I mean, that's what it says subtly to him when you just bypass him. Here's a fourth thing. When you talk to others before you talk to your husband. In other words, you got an issue going on, you got a problem, you got something that needs to be done. Well, I'm going to talk to Brother Jim at church because I have a lot of respect for Brother Jim's thought about things, but you haven't even talked to him about it. You talk to somebody else before you even talk to him about it. Now, when he finds that out, what's he going to think? He's going to think you got more respect for him than you do for him. Even your pastor, you shouldn't talk to me about anything that you haven't talked to your husband about. Your husband is your, pat, your shepherd. I'm not your, I mean, I'm like an over-shepherd for the flock, but your shepherd is your husband. And if there's something going on in your home, your shepherd is responsible for what's going on in your home. I'm telling you, God's not going to hold me responsible for what's going on in your home. God holds me for responsible for what I teach in this church and how I lead this flock and whether we're all going in a godly direction and whether you're getting the word that you need to get and you're being taught like you need to be taught and you're being provided for spiritually and overseen and all of that. But if it's something going on in your house, don't call me to come fix something at your house. It's your shepherd's responsibility, not mine. If something needs to be prayed for, talk to your husband and say, "Hun, you're the shepherd of the house. You pray about this. If there's some kind of a spiritual issue going on at the house, go to your husband and say, man, you're the shepherd of our flock, and I think we got a demon activity going on against our family, and we need to pray and ask God to cover us with this and move this out of our life. Well, don't call the pastor first and say, can you come pray and anoint my house? Call your husband, get it to your husband, say, Hus man, we need to anoint our house or something, and you, we need to get you to pray. And then, guys, it's your responsibility to come against the thief and the robber or whatever it might be doing, spiritual or physical. I mean, if somebody was standing at your front door with a shotgun in their hand waiting to come in and blow your family away, you'd do something about that, wouldn't you? I mean, you wouldn't just open the door and say, hey, come on in and shoot my family and kill my family. No, you'd protect your family. Well, just like that, spiritually, there are enemies standing at the door of your house, standing at the door of the Internet, standing at the door of websites and all these other kind of things, standing at the door of the kids at school or whatever, trying to get in and kill your family, kill your flock, destroy your flock, influence your flock, steal the minds and the hearts and the dreams of your children, the potentials and the futures, plant images in their mind that will never go away, ruin their future uh, relationships with their mates because nobody can compare to these pictures that are put forth as being the example of love and sex and so forth. I mean, see, this, this, is what, this is the subtlety of life. And guys, we're the shepherd and God holds us responsible. And, and so when you talk to other people before you talk to your husband, you're saying, I don't respect you enough to talk to you about this. I don't think you'd do anything about it. You're so weak and you're so unspiritual and so unchristlike. I don't have any confidence in you. That's what it's saying to him. That's what he's receiving. And then you wonder why he doesn't love you like he's supposed to because you've mutilated him and castrated him and everything else. So he can't be the man he's supposed to be, and therefore you suffer because he, if he doesn't sense respect, he's probably not going to give love. And then if you don't sense your love, you're not going to give respect, and boom, round we go. You know, the circle goes round and round and round, and I'm telling you, here's the circle. It's going round and round and round, right down the hole is where it's going. No love, no respect. No love, no respect. No love, no respect. Somewhere along the way, somebody has to break that cycle. So I'm just saying to you that you can choose. My husband 
does not meet my needs. My husband does not show me that he loves me and that I march at the head of his parade. Okay, so what choices do you have? The choice is I can let this, this relationship deteriorate further by showing him that I don't have any respect for him because I'm not getting what I need, or you can step up and break the cycle and say, I don't care whether I'm getting what I need or not, I'm gonna respect my husband as the head of this family, and then when you do that, you have the opportunity to turn that cycle around and get it going the other way. I mean, it's your choice. So I'm just saying, is that a little bit too heavy? Um, when you belittle him in front of others, when he overhears you talking about the fact that he can't do anything, boy, ooh, your husband built a wonderful fence around the yard. I wish my husband could do that. He can't do anything. He can't even nail a nail. He, and then he overhears that. How, what do you think that makes him feel? It makes him feel like that you respect somebody else's husband, you don't respect him, that he's not really much of a man because you don't even think he can do anything. I mean, it just it's subtle like that. Or, or you say that in front of somebody else, and then the worst, he hears them repeat it to somebody else in his presence. You know, well, guess what she said? She said, Jim can't do anything. And, Jimmy, and then he overhears that, and man, now you got the double whammy. Not only did you say it, but now other people hear it. Now, you know, my Lord. And, and, and you see, that's, I'm just saying that the subtlety of these kind of things is where we need to pay attention. And to not be unaware of what we're doing because we don't know what it means for him to be considered the shepherd of our life. All right, so number one, ladies, you want to show your husband's respect? There's the law of the shepherd. All right, does anybody have any questions, requests for prayer? <laughs> you want to quit right now and say, Pastor, you're being too mean to us or something like that? All right, I just want you to know the truth, and I'm... I'm trying to be truthful with you about all these kind of things, all right? Um, number two, wife, law, the law of companionship. Companionship. The number two perceived emotional need for men is, com is for companionship. Would you like to guess what the number one is? When I say it, you'll go, oh, yeah, sexual fulfillment. Sexual fulfillment is number one for men in their perceived needs. Now, I mean, when you ask a group of men, you say, hey, what is it you need most? The number one answer is I need to be sexually fulfilled. Number two is for companionship. Now, this might surprise you, but companionship means I need somebody who is with me. I need them to be involved with me that we can be compatriots, that we can be companions, that I have somebody I can do stuff with. Now, you might wonder why men like to congregate together and do things together, like they like to go to ball games together, they like to go play golf together, they play softball, they get on bowling teams, they, have, uh, they meet at the bar for a drink or whatever it is that they do, they get with other men and do it. And the reason why is because their wife won't do it with them. I mean, in other words, you, you are intended by God to be the companion for, for your husband. Listen to this verse. This verse is out of, uh, out of Malachi 2, okay? In Malachi, it's talking about divorce. It's talking about husbands who get rid of their wives and deal treacherously with them. And listen, listen to what it says. Yet you say, Malachi, by the way, just so you'll know, Malachi is a group of accusations where God comes in and says to men, this is what you do. And God says, you dishonor me with your lips. And then they come back and they say, then they try to give an excuse why they didn't do it. And then, and then he makes another charge against them. And then they come back and say, but yet here's what we've done and we didn't mean it. And then he says something else. Now, by the time you get to chapter 2, the Lord is bringing an accusation against them and talking to them about the destruction of their families and their homes and so forth. And then they give him an excuse for why that happens. And then this is 
this is one right this is a verse right in the middle of that kind of discussion so look at what listen to what it says it's on your it's on your scripture sheet i gave you malachi 2 14. all right god's made this charge about their homes breaking down and what a curse that is and all that and then they come back yet you say god says you did this and then now they come back and and and, and malachi says yet here's your here's your yet you say for what reason and then here's the answer, because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And God is saying here, all right, your families are falling apart and your life is falling apart because you have been given a companion. A compa- the word companion means compatriot. The word companion means a soldier who comes alongside you. In other words, God is saying, you know what your wife is? Your wife is your partner. Your wife is like somebody who's got your back. Like, like you and a fellow soldier watch each other and you say, I got your back. And they say, I got your back. And you, and you walk side by side or back to back protecting yourself against the enemy. God says that's what husbands and wives are. They are companions with each other. And yet in Malachi is saying, you've just thrown that away. You've just dealt treacherously with her. You've said, hey, it doesn't matter and all that. But my point is what God says we are to be. It says we need a companion. Now, if you want to know what baseball teams and soccer teams and bowling teams and drinking team and meeting in somebody's garage with a bunch of the guys or going to a ball game, you want to know what that's all about? Companionship. We need companionship. Men need companions. And if you won't be it, we got to find somebody else to be our companion. And we're probably not going to choose a woman because most women are not interested in men's stuff. What the Bible is saying, whether you're interested in it or not, you got to be it. God says, be a companion. There was a study done, and I know I've shared this with you before, but um, there was, there's been a study done where they took 100 high school students and they put them in the library, about 50 men and 50 women, and then they told them that they were going to do some kind of a survey or whatever, and they took... Uh, Uh, about four or five women, and they put them in a room by themselves with just some chairs in the room and left them alone just to see, okay, what's going to happen? Well, when they left them alone, they found that after 15, 20 minutes, you know, that, of course, as they began to talk to each other, now, I mean, they've been there a long time, what do you think's happening? I don't know, man, what in the world's going on right? And it, it kind of began to bring them together a little bit. And what they found is the women would just naturally take the chairs like this, and when the women would, would talk to each other, they would get like this, face to face, and talk to each other face to face. The men, on the other hand, in the same conditions, the men would get their chairs and put them side by side and would sit there side by, man, what you think's going on? I don't know. Uh, boy, it looks like a good game, doesn't it? I mean, they're <laughs> side by side, and, and, and that's what... That's what men need. They need somebody that, w- that will be side by side. In other words, men like to do a lot of things that re- don't require a lot of conversation. You know, go watch ball games, sit there, watch TV, uh, go golf and drive golf cart. I mean, uh, you know, you don't like the game, you don't want to try. I mean, just get out here and go with me. Be my partner, be my buddy, be my pal, be somebody I can say, man, that was good. Whoo, I don't know. Whoo, that was a nice shot. I mean, just, just. Just being a partner, being a compatriot, being a companion, being a pal, you know. And, and so when you do this, this says to your husband, I respect you. When you say, I'm going to be in your life, I'm going to get involved in what you like to do. I'm going to get involved in, in, in what interests you, what you think is is good, what you like, what you enjoy. I'm going to do this because I realize you need me to do this. We talk about things. We share adventures in life. We, we live through things together. We talk about things that would never come up in any kind of normal discussion out here because we've just experienced something together. We drive around and look at things. We you know, we dream together. We talk to each other about, oh, man, look at that. One of these days, 
I hope we can have something like that. What is that saying? That's saying, here's what I dream about. Here's what, here's what my, my passion is about. And we share it with each other because we're companions. See, and it's natural. It's not like, okay, let's sit down and let's get face to face and let me tell you what I think is important in life. And you have this very serious, just focused discussion. No, that's uncomfortable for men. We don't like to do that. We like to just kind of naturally talk to things. We like to not even look at it. If you've ever noticed men, when they sit down, they don't even look at each other. They just start talking. Hey, man, what about, what about them dogs? Yeah, they did good. Yeah, yeah, they did good. Well, what happened to them? You know, I mean, you just talk look, looking at something else, and you're talking to them. You know, you're not sitting here looking in somebody's eyes and saying, oh, what do you think about the Green Bay Packers? Or what, you know, I mean, it's just men are this way and men and when you get into their life and you're a companion it shows that you respect them and it says to them you're my man you're the greatest boy i like your life it's exciting it's fun let's let's live some more of it and when you do this you 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 give him a position to minister to you from with loving caring thoughts that can bring some security in your life. You know what he's thinking. You know where he's going. You know what makes his bell ring. You know what he loves. You know what his passions are because you're there when it happens, you know? All right. Any, any discussion about that? I'm, I'm just jabbering on through, so if y'all have anything, please say it, okay? Here's law number three. Law number three is the law of silence. This is from 1 Peter 3, the law of silence. 1 Peter 3. <laughs> Swift to speak. <laughs> Swift to hear. This, this one, I'm going to tell you, this is probably the hardest one of all. This one, is the, this one is the most easily violated of any of the disrespect issues. Uh, and I'll show you in just a minute. I'll, I'll give you some examples of how you can break this. But the law of silence, here's from 1 Peter 3, and it's in your... It's in your uh, scripture notes. 1 Peter 3, verse, verse 1. Wives, likewise. So it's, it's, it, it's been saying something about husbands. Now it's going to say something about wives. Wives, likewise. Be submissive to your own husbands. Listen to this. That even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. In other words, if the wife knows how to hold her tongue and not speak disrespectful and just controls what she says, that even if the husband is not a believer, that he's going to be influenced toward Christ, not by what she says, but by how she acts. Now, I know this might seem like a long way around the cycle, but according to the scripture, if you're, this, this passage is just talking about exclusively Christian women. And it's saying, I know you have a desire for your husband to come to the Lord. And I know you're going to try to talk to him about this. And it's okay to mention it. It's okay to say, honey, I'm praying for you that the Lord's important in our life. And I believe that Jesus is our Savior. And I, I want you to be with me forever in eternity. I mean, it's okay to say stuff. But, but know that. If you know how to control what you say out of your mouth, that the very act of being able to control that testifies to your husband who doesn't know the Lord, the fact that something has control over you that is, that is very powerful and is to be respected. And he will say, man, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what happened down there in the church, but boy, it sure has changed the way... She used to be like a biting sow. I mean, man, she was after me with both barrels at all times and just accusing me and, and, and talking to me and like I'm some kind of kid, blah, blah, blah. But now, hey, so what's going on down there? What is that all about? What could be that powerful? See, it, it begins a searching. It opens a door in him for the Holy Spirit to come in and say, here's what's happened to her. Here's what's changed her. You need to consider this too. If it's powerful enough to do this with her, it must be real. It must be something that's valuable. And, and it's just talking about a way 
for wives to have an influence in the salvation of their husbands without even saying a word involved in it. And so it implies that, you know, if we'll hold our tongue, it will really be important. And, and in your notes, you, you might see this in that first little section of notes. It says, we often hold our tongue when showing respect at work. If you ladies work, you don't say everything at work that you want to say, right? There are certain things you don't say at work because you know if you do say it, you're going to get fired or it's going to cause trouble for you at work. So you, you can hold your tongue if you respect your job. Uh, there are things you don't, you hold your tongue at school, same thing. You hold your job out at the ball field. You don't say everything to the coach you really want to say because it would be totally out of order and out of disrespect. So the implication is, uh, if you can do this in other places, why can't you do it at home? Why can't you be just as respectful to your husband as you are to all these other situations? A wife can disagree without becoming disagreeable, appeal without losing respect. When a wife operates in this spirit, even if her husband's not yet saved, he perceives her attitude as respect. Uh, Tanya and I have been married for 40 years now. I've given Tanya lots of reasons to disrespect me. Men, we all, we, we, we give our wives multiple reasons to lose respect for us. Most of the time, we're not even trying to do. We're really trying to be helpful. I, I'll give you one example. When Tanya and I were just married, we, we lived in a, a mobile home that we bought. Our notes were $87 a month. Give you an idea of how long ago that was. Our house note, eighty-seven dollars a month. You know what our thoughts were? How in the world are we ever going to pay this? <laughs> and uh, but we did. But anyway, the point is, we we lived. I, I was still in my senior year at state, and Tanya was working, and so she worked all day, and I went to school, and I worked part-time job, and I was also part-time at church, uh, working with youth and music and so forth. And so we and we just had a real busy life. Everything was real busy. So I, I worked at a school not very far from our home, and so I would get a lunch hour. So when I would get the lunch hour, I would come home and put a load of, of clothes in the washer, and that kind of thing, dry thing. And, and, um, and I remember the, clothes, the white clothes kept getting dingier and dingier, and the colored clothes kept losing more and more color. And I would dry things that weren't supposed to be dried or whatever. I remember one time in particular that uh, I, I don't know what kind of sweater it was, but I washed it and then I put it in the dryer. And when we got home that afternoon, the dryer was finished and the sweater had shrunk, you know, way down. And I came to Tanya and I said, "Hun, uh, I got some good news and some bad news. <laughs> she said, well, what's the bad news? I said, well, I shrunk your sweater. She said, what's the good news? I said, well, if we have a daughter one day, she'll already have, <laughs> she'll already have a wardrobe. <laughs> now, now, Tanya could have crushed me at that moment. She could have, you know, she could have lamb blasted me. She could have said, how stupid are you? You don't know that you're going to shrink stuff and blah, blah, blah. I mean, she could have totally demoralized me is what I'm saying. And had every right to say, you know, come on, man, you got to pay attention. What's wrong with you? I mean, and, and, yeah, right. Read the label. What's going on with you? And, and, in other words, and I mean, I'm trying to help. I'm trying to, you know, help, but I, I, I wasn't efficient on all of that, but I was trying to do my part. But seeing, even when I'm trying to do my best, I, I still gave her a reason to disrespect me in life, and so I'm just saying to you ladies that there are going to be lots of opportunities for you to disrespect your husband by saying what you think at the moment. I love my, my favorite pe preacher, and he's dead, he's with the Lord now, and, and Bev and Lawrence, you may know him, others you may never even heard his name, but E.V. Hill is my favorite preacher. E.V. Hill was pastor of uh, Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles, he used to say, uh, he, he said, I'm the pastor of uh, Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles, the city of angels, though lost many may be, you know. And he was a great pastor, man, and just a brilliant preacher and orator and everything. And I loved him. Still, still go, you can go on the Internet right now, and there are just hundreds of messages. great. But anyway, uh, he was telling about the fact 
of, about at his wife's funeral. His wife passed away uh, years before he, he went to be with the Lord. And he preached her funeral because she asked him to preach her funeral. And he said, I'm at her funeral. He said, I'm not getting up as an act of super strength or, or any, but he said, I'm fulfilling a wish of my member, not only my wife, but my member by preaching her funeral. And he told the story of them. And he said, uh, one day he came home from work and, and he said her normal place was at the door. When he came home, she would always meet him at the door, but this day she wasn't at the door. And so he's thinking what, Oh, something, you know, she's mad at me about something or she's, you know, angry about something. And she's, you know, not at the door where she normally was, though he came on in and he said that when he came in, there were candles all over the house, no lights, just candles. And, so he called her, he called her baby. He said, baby, uh, what meanest thou this? You know? And she said, uh, she said, well, you know, we've been married for six months now. And she said, I thought we would just uh, dine by candlelight tonight. And he thought, well, that's groovy, you know? And so he put his stuff down and he went into the bathroom, but she had neglected to put a candle in the bathroom. And so when he went into the bathroom, it was dark. And he said, he flipped on the switch and no light came. <laughs> And he said, oh, he said, oh, oh, they've cut off our power. And he said he, called, he went back in there where she was, and he said, baby, he said, did they cut our power off? And she said, yes. And he said, why didn't you tell me? And she said, well, you work so hard, and, and times are tough. But we're going to get these lights back on. We're going to get the money. We're going to get these lights back on. And he said at her funeral, he said, at that point, she could have crushed me. She could have demoralized me. She could have looked at me and said, I'm the daughter of Milton Carruthers, which was a real, he was a professor at, in college. He was a great professor. And I'm the daughter of Milton Carruthers, and I've never had my power turned off. I've never had it this bad. I've never been in a situation like this, and we've got to get it together. He said she could have crushed me at that moment and demoralized me at that moment. But instead, she chose to control her tongue and say, that's all right, baby. You work hard, and times are tough, and I didn't, you, you, you try so hard, and you work so hard, and we're going to get these lights back on. It's going to happen for her. And, and, and so she encouraged him rather than demoralizing him because when you demoralize your man, you are really removing him from the position of being the lover toward you that you really need in life. In other words, you're cutting your own throat. Mm -hmm. It's what it boils down because you're removing him from the position where he can speak into your life. And so the law of silence just says, when you sense disrespect rising up in you, uh, grab that tongue. And don't say things that, that are going to undermine um, what you what you really need. You're not the. Uh, there are several examples here. Uh, you're, well, you're just not the handyman type. Th now these are things you. These are things you would say to him, that would be like he's trying. He and you say, well, I guess you're not just not the handyman type or something like that. And what you're just saying is, uh, you stupid. Why did you even try to do that? You know you can't do stuff like that. Uh, or it might help if you'd read the instructions. See, you see, that's disrespect. You're saying, what are you, so dumb you can't read instructions? I told you to do that. You better listen to me next time. And, and, and all that's doing is just crushing that spirit within him to, to try to do something, to try to put it together. To try to, now, it's right. He should have read the instructions. But, that's, but if you say that to him, you're implying that he's not sufficient. That he, in other words, see, you, you've got to hold that when you're sensing disrespect. Uh, honey, uh, can we please just stop and ask somebody for direction? <laughs> you know, we men, no, we've got to do it ourselves with a conqueror. Uh, do you even know how to plan a romantic evening? You know, in other words, he's tried to do something sweet and nice and be romantic, and, and it's falling apart. And, and, I, and, and these are just some examples of the different kind of things we can say. You see how subtly this can happen? Without you really thinking about the fact that what you're doing is disrespecting him, you can disrespect him by, by just not paying attention to what's coming out of your mouth and not holding, you know, that, that tongue when you feel that 
mm, that sense of dishonor rising up in you and you want to say something smart aleck or sarcastic or you know within you that you just hold that and you don't say that because you don't want to demoralize him you don't want to crush his confidence you need for him to be your shepherd you need for him to be the man in your life because he's going to supply for you something that nobody else can supply for you and you need for him to be in that position in your heart and in your life and and create that respect for him so law number three is law of silence. And law number four, all right, moving right along, the law of beauty. I'm going to read this one right out of our manual that we wrote, Tanya and I wrote for you. I think Tanya probably wrote a lot of this point because this sounds just like what she would say. And uh, anyway, listen, listen to this, and I'll kind of expand it just a little bit. This comes from 1 Peter 3, verse 3. You know, we just read verse... 1 Peter 3, verse 1, where it says, Wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Uh, and even if they don't obey the word, they without a word might be won by the conduct of their wives. Verse 3 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward. And you can underline the word merely. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. By the way, this verse right here is where some of these really stringent people strain at a gnat and swallow a camel in this thing about makeup. This is the verse right here that some denominations have chosen to say, we're not going to wear makeup, we're not going to cut our hair, we're not going to dress in modern, uh, modern clothes because we don't want to, we want our inward woman to be beautiful and not think about the outward. But notice what this verse says. It does not say, don't think about the way you look. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward. doesn't say not any outward. It says, <laughs> do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So... That verse is misinterpreted to say that the, the Lord is teaching us not to worry about the way we look and the way we do our hair and what kind of clothes we wear, but be beautiful on the inside. That's the most important thing. Well, it is true that the most important thing is for you to be beautiful on the outside, but it is not true that the Lord is telling you don't worry about the outside at all. It just said don't get so wrapped up in the outside you forget about the inside. It doesn't say the outside is not important. Let me just read it because I can get in trouble with this. So let me just read it, all right? Not, not with you guys that are here because I know you guys are completely understand this, but those guys on the Internet, they, they might misunderstand this. Let me, let me read it. The outer woman should communicate respect as well as the inner woman. A wife should be modest and respectful in the way she dresses, seeking to attract no one but her husband. Her outward beauty should be obvious to her husband as she seeks to attract him for life. In other words, you should try to be attractive to your husband. You should try to look your best. Work it, baby. I mean, you know, the goods you got, God's given them to you. Take advantage of them. Be the best you can be. Look at that second. The wife should minister to her husband's intimate needs. And that's out of 1 Corinthians 7. In other words... Your husband has sexual needs. It's your job to fill them. It's your job to provide for him. If he desires this, that's your job. You are his. He is yours. Don't use this as a weapon. Don't withhold this. Uh, make yourself attractive so he will desire this. He is visually stimulated. That's so true. Men are, men are stimulated by what they see. Just always know that. That's why pornography is such a dangerous weapon of the enemy because it just naturally feeds what attracts us as men. We see stuff and we are stimulated by what we see. So I'm just saying that you, are, you want to be attractive to your husband. You want him to desire you. So realize it's important what he sees when he sees you. Okay, let's just move on from there. And 
she is emotionally stimulated. So you are stimulated by the desire that he wants you, that he craves you, that you are the focus of his desire. That's what you're stimulated by. He's stimulated by what he sees. When a husband sees his wife wanting to fulfill his physical needs, he perceives this as respect. Ladies, you may want to pray before you dig deeper into this issue. Are you ready? Okay. This is why I'm reading it, all right? While it is true that what is, that, that what is on the inside matters most, what's on the outside matters some. Please understand that men don't need their wife to be a size three, but they do need her to make the effort to take care of herself. Let's put the shoe on the other foot. When your husband truly puts forth the effort to plan a romantic evening for you, do you really mind if it's not perfect? Of course not. You just feel loved that he cared enough to try. Most men didn't mind less than ideal proportions, but seeing you make the attempt to look your best, even if you're not going anywhere, is an issue of respect for him. Likewise, coming home to a slouch in sweatpants and curlers is a sure sign of disrespect. Now, please resist the urge to ask your husband about this. If you're feeling defensive about the subject, chances are you're neglecting this aspect of your relationship. <laughs> If you feel that clenching coming up inside of me, of you, you're the one I'm talking to, all right? Remember, this is not about him loving you just the way you are, but it's about you loving him enough to be all that you can be. I'm sure he, he does love you for you, but wouldn't it be nice if you loved you for him? Taking care of yourself is taking care of him too. It's an issue of respect, which to him is the same way as saying, I love you. Uh... When he sees you dolling yourself up to go out other places, but you don't doll yourself up for him, what is that saying to him? You don't matter. I care what others think, but I don't really, I mean, you know, hey, we've been together all this time, but I know I don't have to try to, I don't have to try to look nice for you, you know. You're supposed to love me anyway. And uh, I mean, you can just excuse yourself a thousand ways, but what this is saying is that you need to show him respect by by dolling yourself up for him just like you'd doll yourself up for somebody else. I mean, if somebody's coming over to the house, like another couple or whatever, you go in and put some makeup on, put on some, something that looks fairly nice and frou-frou and smell good and all that, but when he comes home from work, you look like something the cat's drug in and the dog wouldn't drag back out. <laughs> so what does that say to him? You don't matter enough for me to take the effort, to make the effort to look good because we're not seeing anybody, it's just you. And what I'm saying to you is if you'll make the effort to, I mean, to, you don't have to be Cosmo or anything, but just be present, you know, presentable. I mean, look, look like you made the effort to try to be attractive for, for him because the, the desire of your life is for him. That's what it's supposed to be. I mean, that's what you said. You said in this covenant you made that, do you promise to love her, to honor her, to cherish her in this relation, uh, forsaking all others, cleave only to her so long as you both shall live? I do. Do you promise to love him, to honor him, to respect him, forsaking all others and cleave only to him? In other words, do you promise to not try to attract other men but only attract him? Do you promise to not try to get other men to lust after you and, and all of that, but you try to make yourself presentable and keep his interest up in you? Do you promise to do that for the rest of your life? I do. That's what you're saying. And I'm just saying that you need to remember this, that you need to, I mean, look, you obviously are attractive to him. Or, or else, you know, he wouldn't have been. I don't care if you've put on 10 pounds. I don't care if you've, you know, if you're 15 years older. I don't care if you wear glasses now and you didn't wear them. When, I mean, you know, you, you have changed, and so has he, and we all change. But believe, you just have to believe me when I say it to you. You are still attractive to him. He loves you. When he sees you, he sees the love of his life. He sees someone that's attractive to him. And so work it. You know, this says, I respect you. I not only respect the TV guy coming and install cable so I don't look like something the cat's drug in and a dog when he walks in. Why do I care what he thinks? 
What I ought to care about is what you think when you walk in. So I'm going to frou-frou myself up a little bit and at least smell good and look like, you know, look like I was ready for you to come home and meet you at the door with a smile and a hug and a, I love you and it's good to have you home. I hardly could wait till you got here, you know, kind of a sense. And when you do this, it says, I respect you. And when your husband senses respect, he senses love. That's what he needs out of your life. All right? So there we go. I don't want to say too much about that. Uh, I think you get it, though. Number five, here's the last one, and it's right on time. I'm just a few minutes late. The law of mercy. Um, the law of mercy says that sometimes you just got to let stuff go, that, there's, that, that there are going to be hundreds of things that happen in life where you're going to get disappointed by your mate that you're going to be, uh, uh, it's not going to be enough. It's not going to, it's not going to be totally good or right. Or, you know, in other words, we're, we're going to, there are going to be hundreds of things that we men do that you could totally hold against us. Sometimes unintentional, sometimes maybe, sadly to say, it might be intentional. You know, it might be like, you know, we do something to to say, I'm not going to, you're not going to tell me what to do. And maybe it's intentional. And they, in, in other words, there are lots of things that are not going to be plumb in your life always. So we're going to give you an opportunity to hold things against us, to uh, bring things up from the past, and because all of that just didn't work out. And what this law says is the law of mercy basically says sometimes you just have to let stuff go. And don't bring it back up. Now, ladies, you have the tendency to keep the list. And five years from now, you'll bring something back up like, well, you remember when you said, man, you know, the Lord says, let it go. Don't hold it up. Uh, one of my fa favorite sayings is, it may not be plum, plum, but it's plum some. And sometimes plum some has to be good enough. Because there's never going to be plum, plum in everything in life. So that means you got to let it go. The law of mercy says uh, let things go. Let, like, like the woman at the well. You remember the story where Jesus met her and said, I can give you living water. And she said, uh, uh, give it to me. And he says, okay, go call your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He said, you've spoken the truth. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're living with now is not your husband. And she said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> You know, I believe you're a prophet. Like the woman at the well, many women have been wound, wounded and ruined by the men in their life. And that's true. Satan will try to convince you that all men are the enemy, that none of them can be trusted, God included. And all of them need to be fixed. This kind of attitude will stop stop you short of showing your husband the respect he needs for the good health of your relationship. While no one should intentionally wound another, imperfect people are involved, which means missteps will happen. Don't make the added mistake of withholding respect from your mate because he fails to live up to your standards. Recognize past hurts as a possible root of disrespect toward your husband. Re release your hurt and trust God to heal your wounds. A lack of trust toward men will cripple you, cripple your marriage, and therefore uh, cripple your ministry. Ladies, do you withhold respect from your husband, demanding that he earn it by living up to your standards of perfection? Many times a man doesn't love because he receives no respect, and a woman gives no respect because she's not receiving any love, and the cycle goes, never-ending and always spiraling downward. Would you be willing to make a commitment toward your marriage relationship by choosing to show your husband respect in at least one of the ways that we've talked about? Make a prayer of commitment and write it in the space below. That was your homework. You see, though, I mean, nobody can live up to that perfection that we all expect. And your husband's not going to live up to that perfection. Just know that. So you've got to be merciful. <laughs> you get lots of ways to show mercy. All right, there it is, the law of respect. Is that helpful to you anyway? Are you blessed? You're never coming back to church? Pastor's too tough on you? All right. Remember, I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody in this building. I'm accusing all, everybody on the Internet. I think. <laughs> you guys didn't. Yeah, but. You started this 2005 when Katrina 
Atlanta, you started 2004, no, 2003 was August. Right. And I think, uh, so we started in 2005. Right. With, 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 you know, the first, you know, right, with the first school. And, school. This now, I've, anyway, I've been there before. Right. But uh, this class here and the different things in it about the men and, and the women, it, it helped me a lot. Man. It really helped me a lot. That's so good. Also the fact that uh, when you've been married before, you have uh, sometimes it didn't, it didn't it didn't go well. Right. Right, and, that's exactly and because right. Because of it not going well, and and all those things that were said, some of them right. about the men were not there. Right. And so you tend to have to be rather disappointed. Plus, if you have been a woman that has that has children, right, and you've been a widow, right, that's another thing for so many years, and you've had to do right everything, you know, for the yeah, children. right, every all the decisions. It, yep. it becomes a little difficult when you marry. When you marry, yep. and you've already you've been the one that's been doing yep. everything to become to turn it over and be submissive. Right. This class here really did help me because we had been married uh, two years. Uh huh. And two years when we came back. Yeah. And so <laughs> it, it it all those other preconceived. Things that were in my life. Right. And how things happened. I mean, I knew how it was supposed to go. Right. But when you're the one yep. that's, that's in charge and doing everything, right. this class here, it really helps. I mean, I, I recommend it to any. Well, that's a good word. coming up to, 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 to listen to this. Yeah. You know, it helped a lot. It helped me a lot. Right. Uh, to understand my husband. Better right. Yeah. And to be a better wife. Right, and thank you, Belle, for saying that. And, and, and that's what it's intended to be. It's intended to, like, like Belle said, she's been married, uh, what, five, is it five times altogether? Is this your fifth? Mm -hmm. And, some, and some, she's, some she's been widowed from. And, uh, and, 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 of course, she grew up in an environment uh, in Chicago, and, and uh, you know, there, was lot, there were lots of reasons for a lot of what was going on. But for a long time, you know, she had to rear her boys and daughter and in a tough environment, a tough life, and she had to be protective, and she had to be the man and the woman. And so it created tendencies within her to be more, more man-like and to take the bull by the horns and have to be tough and have to be strong and have to be provider, protector, priest of your family because you were the only thing they had and you were it. Well, that creates tendencies in you that if you have relationships in the future, that you don't do what you should do because you don't realize that you have now gotten used to doing man things yeah, yeah. and that undermines the marriage that you have. Yeah. And so the Lord brought you, they had been married a couple of years when they came here. And so Bev's testimony is that it helped her to let go of the reins of some of that mm -hmm. stuff and not run her man off mm -hmm. or belittle him or, or, or demasculize him because she won't let stuff go and become the woman that God created her to be. See, we both have a role, and our role, we, we both need each other and what we provide just as, as much as, as the other. In other words, wives, you really need to be the wife because you, by being the wife, you help him be everything he can be. And men, you need to be the man because when you are the man, you help her be everything she needs to be so that together you are both elevating each other mm -hmm. to become everything God created you to be. And together you become stronger and more capable together than you ever would have been separately. And that's why God put you together. Tanya and I have been married 40 years. Over these 40 years, she should be better in, lo in all the areas of life than she was when we got married mm -hmm. because of what I provide and what I do. And I should be better because of what she provides and what she does. And I'm going to tell you, my testimony is I'm way better. I guarantee you uh, she's been a great and faithful wife and, and all, meets all of these conditions in life. And, and I pray that I'll be the kind of husband that she needs because 
in this crazy world we live in now, we need all the strength that we can have. And our children need to be able to look at our lives and model what they see and say, when I get married, I want a, I want a man like dad. I'm looking for, and, and, and because dad is everything he needs to be, she's not out there as a, vul as a vulnerable young lady who doesn't have respect for men and has no idea of what, what love looks like from a man because she's never seen it before. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a dad that loves mom. She doesn't know what to look for and she doesn't know what it looks like. And so she becomes vulnerable to every young man with a good line mm -hmm. that, can, that she thinks can give her something that she needs because her needs are wide open because dad's not met the need for being the shepherd of the family like he needs to be. So the cycle, and then she's a little bit, and I'm going to use the word sick, because, to lack of a better word, she's needy, she's vulnerable, so she marries or she gets attracted to somebody who's needy and vulnerable themselves, and then they get together, now they got a dramatic, wacko relationship that's going nowhere except down, and then they usually produce some kind of offspring that ends up getting trapped in some kind of a dysfunctional environment and they go down. And so over a period of time, your family that maybe was here, next generation goes here, next generation goes here, next generation goes here, and the branches of your tree starts growing down instead of out like this, like you intended to be. And it all started because of love and respect. And it's just simply because we didn't know any better. You know, it's what it boils down to. Right. Four boys and a girl. Yeah, right. And, and my four my, big boys. Our young men now. <laughs> yeah. They have the most respect for him. Like they were around. Absolutely. They knew what uh, a man could not be. Right. Yeah. They got good examples they, of what a man is supposed to be. Good yeah. examples of that. <laughs> right. And so for him to step in. Yeah. And be the man. Yeah. And the father. Right. And take over. I mean, this, this, this is his. They love it. Yeah, right. All oh, our kids. Love right. It because he's the man. And you know why? Because they see what he did with their mom. Exactly. And he sees the change in the mom yeah. and how much mom respects him and how much mom loves him and what kind of honor mom. And so they're getting their cue from mom mm -hmm. to say. I mean, they call him old man. Like, mm -hmm. old man. <laughs> Is uh, old man is the boss. Old man is the man. Why? Because if mama, if mama respects him, and mama loves him, and mama believes in him, then he's the man, you know. And they get their cue from all her. From all from that. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. You're welcome, babe. And we love you. And I thank, thank you. you. That's a good word. It's a good word thank from you. Too. Well, praise the Lord. So there you go, guys. Teach this to your children. Model this. For your children. Model this for your own life. I know you're going to mess up sometimes, you know, and it's, you're not perfect, but, but do everything. Look over these things from time to time and, and, and ask the Lord, help me. Next class, next journey class, if you don't want to be in every one of them, come back for this because just reminders every now and then will help you to be better because the intention is that, you know, we would be better, that we would learn, that we would be instructed. With the word of truth, you know, it's going to elevate us. You take it every time it comes around. I know. <laughs> I know it. I know it. And it's different. It's never the same. I know it. It is a testimony, y'all. It is different. Because uh, Lord knows what you guys need to hear. So, all right. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's dismiss.